this is a dialogue series that's connected to the um, Bratislava conference that we had just about a month and a half ago. Um, Warm welcome all participants back um, to this session. Uh, this is, of course, a joint lecture session. It's a bit later in the day, so we don't expect anyone coming uh, through from Australia, although who knows, maybe we will have uh, someone coming in um, connecting around midnight, <laughs> but perhaps they are already solid, soundly in bed and uh, it will be uh, us from the other more available time zones that are connected to this session. Um, today we have, I am very, very uh, glad, delighted and honored that um, Leticia Merino has accepted our invitation to speak here at the Early Career Dialogues. Uh, Leticia is a um, doctor of anthropology and political science, I believe, from the National uh, Autonomous University of Mexico. Um, she is based in Mexico City, has just accepted a job for uh, being a director of, of the Coordination for Sustainability at this enormous university, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Um, Leticia was all, is also a lead faculty member of the Earth System Governance um, Project. She was the conference chair of the 2019 Oaxaca, um, 2019 Mexico Conference on Earth System Governance. And I was, had the honor to meet her then. And she is a uh, really warm person and I would consider a very good friend of mine. And I am very, very glad to have her here. She will be speaking on um, the topic of uh, policies of natural resources and extractive economic models. So um, please, everyone, um, join me in welcoming Leticia. And Leticia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, it's, I, I am very happy. I'm very honored. I'm very joyful to be, to be here with you. I mean, um, I thank deeply uh, my dear friends, Christina and Noe and, and Gustav and hello, Jane and everybody. Um, and I choose, I mean, when, when Chris invited me to take part in these, in these dialogues, uh, I mean, I, I was concerned, I wanted to be to build a vision on how the earth system governance looks uh, from the global source, from countries and societies that are highly driven, structured by, by international and national and local forces related to what is called extractivism. Uh, so uh, let me put some, some general ideas on the, on the table. And I think uh, as we think in terms of, of the earth system global, of the global system with the different scales, global, national, and, and local, this is a topic that uh, sooner or later affects uh, everybody. So um, do you see my screen? Not yet, do you need to reshare it? Not yet, okay, let me, yeah. let, me, let me go for it. So you, you see my screen. Yes, maybe just make the okay. slides full okay. and then we can let see me, yeah, really well. Yeah, okay. So let me go. So I call it structivist governance and sustainability. And I would say these are general, to, uh, general thoughts of a theme I have been working for the last uh, four years, perhaps. I mean, I used to work most of my academic life and personal life on forest communities in Mexico and Central America and trying to understand their efforts to build local sustainability and governance of these important resources that are forest. And, and mining and extractivism came to these, to these places with, a, with an important, uh, with a very strong force, reshaping uh, local realities. We had to, the chance to, to look at it from, from, from close. When we were in 2009 in the community of Capulalpa, Oaxaca, whose forest have been certified by the Forest Stewardship Council since almost 30 years ago and are now under a mining concession. So what do I mean by extractive economies? Um, I mean, I, I mean uh, countries or activities within countries that, uh, 
develop an intense production and intense extraction uh, without being redundant of mineral and natural resource-based products with little or non-national consumption. And this production is mostly export oriented. I mean, gold, oil, uh, diamonds, copper are not uh, mainly used in, in Latin America, in Chile or in Ghana or in Mexico, the price of copper of, of gold in, in Mexico, which is the case I know better, uh, something like 90% of the gold that is extracted from the countries goes abroad, goes mainly to, to the United States and copper goes mainly to China. And this is a pattern shared uh, by the so-called extracted countries or extracted economies. Um, I, I include in this definition, agricultural uh, export oriented uh, production of goods. I mean, such as soy in South America, mainly in Brazil and Argentina. I mean, most of this soy, it's not consumed in, in Brazil or Argentina, but in Chile. Or the case I've been studying uh, very closely, which is about avocado production in Mexico, which is 90% oriented to North American market. And why are they extracted? I mean, a part of promoting a huge deforestation, they made uh, an intense extraction of water resources in a way or in more than a way. I mean, Brazil and Argentina are, export, are exporting water together with so Mexico, it's exporting water together with avocado uh, and water for local consumption is very strongly reduced. So as I said, in a broad definition, uh, extractivists include export oriented agriculture. I mean, sorry for the, for the spelling mistake. As it implies intense use suppression of natural resources such as water, I and mean, very importantly, water. And water, it's a theme around uh, struggles between uh, corporations that perform uh, extractive activities and local populations. Um, extractivism play an important role in many development and the so-called least developed countries, I mean, which are mostly African countries. And extract, extractive economies are mainly placed, not only, but mainly in Latin America and Africa. I would say uh, another feature of, the, of extractivism, and in some cases, uh, these countries have been uh, mainly extractive uh, economies since colonial times. I mean, in the case of Latin America for the last 500 years or 400 years, it's that little value added, it's generated. I mean, uh, locally, nationally, as I was saying, most of the gold is produced, is exported as raw materials. Same for other uh, industrial uh, minerals, same for agricultural product, pro products. I mean, most of the avocado uh, in Mexico, it's transformed, it's exported and transformed in guacamole or other, uh, industrialized uh, products in the United States. Uh, so most of the jobs or a large portion of the jobs are not created locally or nationally, but transnationally, internationally. While the, the impacts, the extraction of resource takes place uh, locally. Uh, it has also uh, played an important role in some uh, South Asian countries such as Indochina, um, Laos, Cambodia, uh, but these, these countries, I mean, are, are moving into uh, more manufacturers and, and no depending on, on extractivism. So extractivism uh, takes place and ha historically has taken place in highly unequal society, societies. It, uh, it has uh, deep colonial roots, I mean, as I was mentioning, uh, it's, it's most prominent in Latin America and Africa. And, uh, and colonial heritage means unequal uh, power relations, unequal access to, to economic assets, unequal access to wealth and income. And extractivism, because of the, of the 
concentration, the need of large investments tend to create concentration of capital, concentration of, of wealth, and concentration of political power. Uh, the prevalence of extract extractivism and the increase in the size of extractive activities in the last 30 years, um, I will talk about it a little later, have tended to deepen social, economic, and political inequality. Getting back to, to examples uh, from Mexico, the, um, the fortunes of the, of the top uh, most uh, wealthiest people in, in Mexico, the three uh, most well, the three wealthiest men in Mexico, the three of them are bankers. One of them has been classified as the top uh, richest, uh, second richest person in the world. The three of them are minors. And since, since 90, the 1990s, their fortune has increased by a thousand percent. During the pandemic, their, their fortune of one of them, the owner of Grupo Mexico, the last during 2020, the wealth of this corporation in Mexico, Grupo Mexico, uh, increased by 50% only in 2022, 2020, and 2020 during the pandemic. So this means also uh, a large concentration of political power. So extractivism has favored um, elite, elite capture and concentration of power, as I said, has created little economic development in terms of value added and economic diversification. I mean, these are countries that tends to specialize in natural commodities production and uh, the size, as I said, of, of investment, but also of the environmental and social impacts have heavily increased over the last uh, 30 decades, as I said. Over this period, I mean, um, when most of free trade agreements took place uh, around the world, I mean, in North America, mainly the North American free trade agreement, but also Mercosur in, in, uh, in South America, uh, the relation, the economic relation with, with the Chinese corporations uh, also intensified in, in South America and Africa has been characterized by the regulation. I mean, the, the social regulations the, the limit to transnational investment was uh, abandoned by, by laws promoted uh, in, in these uh, last 30 years. I mean, I was yesterday, uh, I took part yesterday in a conversation um, for Chile, for a group that, that's, I mean, Chile is going through an important process of uh, writing of a new constitution that will replace the neoliberal. And I don't like to talk, to talk much, very much in terms of neoliberalism because it's, it's, it's used more as a, an adjective than a, than a description category. But um, Chile had a, was the first country in Latin America with a, with a very pro-capital, pro-transnational capital-oriented economy backed by the constitution promoted by uh, Pinochet, by the dictatorship of Pinochet. And now, I mean, thanks to the social movements to, to, that took place two years ago, uh, they are, they are uh, working on a new constitution. And uh, we analyze, I mean, there, this, this group that invited me um, are, are working on a new water law. And they were telling how most of the, of the water rights in Chile, uh, like 90, the water rights to like 90% of the available water in the country are in hands of two or three large corporations depriving large groups of population of access to water, which is a basic resource. So oh, in, in, these, in these periods, there are new actors that are uh, little understood in Latin America, I am not a specialist uh, on Africa, which are China, China uh, Chinese corporations and Canada, very often backed by their embassies. I mean, sorry, I was writing this presentation in the very early morning. So these are new parts of the, of the puzzle. 
As I said, extractive economies have roots in the colonial past but have gone through long processes of economic and political reconfigurations in this large period of 400 years or 200 years in Africa, from colonial schemes to nationally, nationally, nationalization of the, of the lands or of the minerals of the subsoil in most of Latin America, the subsoil, uh, and it's a difference uh, from the United States and Canada, are state-owned in spite or despite the, the rights to, to the land who, can, who may, uh, can be in the hands of communities or, or private actors. And from national, these, these movements of nationalization that took place in the 40s, 50s, 60s, the pendulum, the political and economic pendulum moved to, to neoliberalism that I was talking about, and now to post populist nationalism, I mean, as has been the case of, of Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, I mean, again, uh, a nationalization of, of the resources of or the wealth created by, by mining and agriculture through heavy taxations. Um, and extractivism has a, a strong political uh, influence not only, not only in terms of, of elite capture, but also in terms of the demands of the opposition, the different constituencies created regionally and nationally. And it's also, I mean, in the analysis of extractive economies, and my question is how to, how to build having new future, I mean, sustainable futures in this context, um, a dimension that needs to be considered now that has always been present, but it's more and more important, is the transnational scale uh, that influenced these, these processes. Uh, transnational relations influence local or national extractive economies and societies in terms of global markets. I mean, as the prices of these resources, of these products uh, are fixed, not nationally, but internationally in the, in the financial uh, markets, they are treated as commodities, which uh, limit the, the economic independent, independence of these societies. But transnational relations are also present, present and efficient in terms of political and legal processes. I mean, I, I remember the, the the movement, the initiative of the government of El Salvador, this tiny uh, country in Central America, that in, I mean, about, about 10, 12 years ago, prohibited open pit mining in the country. And everybody was very happy about it, but they, ha they have to face a claim of the corporation that owned the concession which was uh, demanding the government of El Salvador to pay not only for the investment they made, by, but for the, for the plan, the, uh, the, plan uh, the projected uh, earnings they were going to make over a period of 25 years of the concession. So, I mean, Salvador, with very scarce uh, human and, and economic resources, have to fight for 10 years in the OECD, in the international courts against uh, the corporation. Finally, they won, but, and they didn't have to pay, but it was, uh, I mean, what I mean, it's that they had to act. It, it's not only a decision that governments can take in the, in the national scale, but they had to fight and act and think in terms of global legal processes. But also, um, transnational actors have influence in these countries, in our countries, most of Latin America and many countries in Africa, through ideologies, ideologies of the economic elites and ideologies uh, pushed by uh, international NGOs and international coalitions. I mean, uh, the, the political, uh, schemes and the economic schemes of Peru, Ecuador, Mexico were moved from pro-state 
I mean, schemes, I mean, schemes that bet on the state as the, as the legitimate and efficient economic and social uh, actor that should uh, control uh, mineral uh, production to in the in the nineties to pro market schemes. I mean, a huge influence of the Chicago Economic School that proposed that the the, the state was uh, inefficient per se as an economic uh, actor and as a social actor. Though I mean, it lost political uh, legitimacy, and that was mainly. Uh, ideological, I mean, this was never sufficiently proved. I'm not uh, telling that the state is an efficient and legitimate and fair actor per se. I mean, depends on, on which state, which scale of state, uh, which state of democracy, which society, and so on. Um, I remember the say of Elinor Ostrom of beware of panaceas, whether pro-state or pro-market uh, are very broad categories that are more ideological than explanatory, but I mean, because of the influence of the World Bank, of the financial agencies, the development agencies, most of these Latin American, Latin American and African countries move to market oriented uh, governance of, of the structured uh, sector. And from the bottom up, from the, from the international NGOs uh, allied, with local regional uh, communities and, and coalitions, uh, it has also an increased global uh, importance, the recognition of global rights, of indigenous rights, of human rights, to the human right to, to water and so on. So, uh, I mean, my message here is that we have to, to regard different scales when we have to, when we think about uh, understanding uh, local realities driven by extractivism, and when we uh, are committed with a plan of new future. Let me, let me finish. In Latin America, in the last 30 years, a process of reprimarization, I mean, even countries which had important level of industrial development, so, uh, such as Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, uh, were reprimarized uh, because of the economic opening of the, of the economy and the focus uh, driven, as I said, by international agencies to, to the production of, of mineral and agricultural products. Uh, and Latin America, I mean, if you see the data of the CEPAL, I'm not giving data you here, it was a global region, with, perhaps with the richest uh, nature in terms of water availability. I mean, the, the Amazon water basin, uh, Christina can tell us a lot about that in terms of biodiversity, in terms of forest area per capita. And it's now the, the global region which these natural resources are getting destroyed as at the rapidest, the, the, the quickest pace in terms of deforestation, overexploitation and pollution of water bodies and soils, losses of biodiversity and so on. Um, and this, uh, this uh, orientation, this pro-extractivism orientation has been present and this, this blindness towards the destruction of nature has been present in, white, in right wing uh, governments uh, such as Bolsonaro's government uh, right now or, or the government Pineda government in Chile but also in left-wing governments such as Evo Morales in Bolivia, uh, I don't know about Lula da Silva, but my, the current president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, it's, uh, it's pro-extractive economies, thinking of them in terms of, of sources of national wealth, wealth that can be re, uh, redistributed. And in many Latin American countries, and in the official uh, discourse, national property of the subsoil is associated with national identities and values. Uh, I'm, I mean, and a part of extractivism having a huge impact, a terrible impact on nature, it has a huge impact, impact on local livelihoods and we could go on there for, for very long. So let me finish with some uh, questions 
driven for the Earth System Governance uh, Science Plan that I think provide us very, very new and interesting lens to look uh, to these realities and to try to, to build, to contribute to, to build uh, new realities, more sustainable realities. And in very general terms, and this is for discussion, I mean, I question which architecture and agencies are needed, and these are very general uh, questions, sorry, which architectures are architecture and agency are needed for the development of sustainable societies in the context of countries driven by extractivism. What are the meaning of justice? Which is the meaning of justice in this context and how to build justice? Which are the schemes of power distribution and how to build democracy? How can anticipation and imagination be fostered in order to build sustainable futures? So thank you very much. I, I know that we will have a, a very interesting uh, reflection that will help us continue contributing to, to, to a better Earth system governance uh, system. So thank you very much. Thank you kindly, Leticia. That was, it's always really, really interesting to hear you talk and, and, and share your knowledge about um, extractivism, forest management, or uh, especially in the context of Latin America. Um, I'm going to ask all participants, um, first off, I'm going to stop um, the sharing here. I hope you recall the slides, otherwise we put on the, up the questions again, or Leticia may be able to remind us. Um, but I'm just going to ask okay, if you want to. Okay. I'm just and I will. Ask. I will. I will edit a little bit my my presentation, which was made on the rush, uh, <laughs> and I will send it to you. But these are the questions. Can you see them? No, I so I stopped sharing, but but it's okay, Leticia. I think we okay. recall them. I think it's the architecture and agency for um, in the context of extractive economies. I think it was meaning of justice, uh, how to build democracy, and. Uh, how to foster anticipation and, and reflection and reflection yes so i think um maybe if we're just um asking for all the participants um joining in if we can um put, turn on our video cameras just to feel like we're a bit more connected to each other please put it um, in gallery view so you can see everyone actually participating and i would love to now invite everyone if you have any questions if you have any thoughts uh, in respect to Letitia's presentation um, as we have done already uh, in these two days if you have a question either just raise the hand on zoom raise the hand in person um, or just speak up um, but please uh, the floor is all yours So maybe I can, maybe Christina, do you want to initiate uh, the conversation? Maybe that's a good starting point. Hi, Leticia, thank you so much. And I think we, we all have this common ground. We're all facing extractivism in a way, in a way or the other. Um, I have two questions perhaps. One is, can we generalize, like for instance, Brazil, or we do have mineral or like mining, big mining co corporations, but also um, um, big ag agriculture exports. I think the dynamics are the same, really the same, why they're different, or can you do different things with them? Like for instance, starting some dialogue with uh, agriculture, because agriculture does need to have water, they need soil, they need everything. So uh, would there be any grounds to do sustainable agriculture, for instance? This is one question. And I think that's particular to Brazil and uh, and the, our experience with left governments, they did, they did a little bit better, but in, in the sense of shifting the development mode, they did not shift. They reinforced all this agriculture and, and mining all that so right now for me i feel without any hope because we don't i cannot see any future of alternative 
with the current political force? Like, how do you find an alternative in this current scenario that both are extractivists? Like, both have the same kind of development mode in their frames and their, their political strategies and political projects. Even being on the left, they could do, be, they could do better in social aspects or some kind of policies, but they could not shift the development mode. So how, what can we do? <laughs> Are there more, I mean, should I go for this or? Okay, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's large enough. Yeah, yeah I think so. Enough. And there, there are different questions. I mean, first to say that I share your concerns and your, your worry, please. So I think the, the first part of the question or the first question is the, the difference and the, and the similarities of, uh, of mineral extraction and agricultural, large scale agricultural production. As I said, it's, it's similar in terms of of intense use of, of natural resources, though, I mean, mining and especially open pit mining, which is the type of mining that tends to, to prevail in, in most of the, of the world because the, the mineral deposits are getting increasingly exhausted. Obviously, I mean, has a, a, a largest and quickest impact, but as you know, Christina, I mean, agricultural, commercial agriculture, industrial agriculture has also very pervasive impacts, uh, not only in water and soil, but in human and ecosystems health. Um, the, the use of agrochem agrochem agrochemicals, I mean, we were studying that in the case of, of avocado, which is not the worst, I mean, tomato and soil are, and it's not even, it's not the worst because the US market, it's a little bit more regulated. But for the, for the rest of the production, like, and I would say the production goes to, to China, I mean, there are almost no, no restrictions in terms of, of agrochemicals used. Uh, most of them have huge impacts on, on public health, but also in the health of, of animals. Um, the use of transgenic and the, the pesticides associated with the use of transgenic and, and so on. So, but I, I would say these, uh, they perhaps they have more dispersed or more invisible impacts as in human health or in animal health, but they have very strong uh, impacts. I mean, the, the most regulated, and I would say um, production is set that goes to Europe uh, and the United States, but the, but the, the production that, that stays nationally, it's, uh, and the cases of, of, uh, of cancer and uh, developing disabilities are very huge and, and there, there, there are not enough data. So I, I would say they have similarities and they have uh, differences in terms of political, um, in terms of political structure, I would think they both are very similar. They tend to, to promote uh, elite capture um visionally and nationally and they are also very much and increasingly transnationally driven i mean even agriculture we would think that uh, local elites are more more important but this is not the case and in a country uh, like mexico which is uh, increasingly violent and this is very worrisome uh, criminal groups tend to control are increasingly present in mining and in industrial agriculture for money laundering, but also uh, to defend miners' property. So when I say it's that these, they both are increasingly violent to impose their, their conception, to impose their interest, to impose their territoriality in terms of, of Bevington uh, to, to regions and so I think in terms of anticipation and reflection, uh, one action that's important is to promote transparency and schemes perhaps of certification uh, to make consumers in the develop, developed countries and nationally aware of the costs that, that they have and the costs that eventually everybody will pay. 
uh, whether it's in terms of, of global global climate change or in terms of loss of biodiversity of of change of the of the water regimes so um the the idea and again it's very disappointing that progressive governments in latin america have been they have uh tried to have more more resources more taxes to promote social transfers but it's it's only social transfers as you say it's not a change of the economic models of more uh, social driven economies, cooperatives, um, and alternative use of, of nature. Uh, and I think this is a battle again that needs to be fought. This is, this is a struggle that, that needs to be fought locally and transnationally. Um, elites move very much transnationally. Uh, and I think social movements need to move transnationally and nationally. I mean, they are more territorial. Uh, based. And I was thinking uh, for, when I was writing these rights, these, these slides, it's that what's in debate, it's the future. The future we can anticipate and, and imagine. Thank you, Letitia. But sadly, I mean, just to, to, to end up, sadly, I don't think the discourses of, of the Pachamama and the, the back, I mean, the getting back to, to an imagined, idealized, uh, historical past, it's enough to build, to build a future. Thank, Thank you, Letitia. Um, we have a request from one, um, uh, one of our uh, participants to reshare the slide with the question. So um, <clears throat> I'll just ask you to do that. And then I will pass over the word to Thais, uh, who has been waiting to pose a question. Um, and maybe we can have these slides up a little there. bit. Yes, we can see them. Thank you very much. So I think, meanwhile, Thais, you ask a question. And I think we will also take a second question at the same time. Uh, Katinka, maybe you want to read this one out uh, that you post in the chat. And then we can take them both, um, starting with Thais. OK, so thank you and good morning to everybody from Brazil. Uh, my question is kind of a pessimistic one because um, I was reading Anibo Kihano and by the, the questions Professor Christina presented and by the concept of um, the, the extractive economies, like how can we think about anticipation and imagination? Because we came from colonialism and then now we are embedded in a structure which reproduces coloniality, right? And then we have to struggle to uh, make efforts of decoloniality. But as Latin American countries, we can try to do that individually, for example. But then in, in a local scale, we, we, we would be working. For example, when we talk about more progressive governments, which foster more social participation to change um, public policies in the first instance, and then trying to make different foreign policy with um, more uh, active hearing of these different sectors and try to, to work differently. But then we get at the global scale, which is deeply rooted in coloniality, still deeply rooted in coloniality. So how can we have a more optimistic uh, perspective and work with uh, uh, imaginations that were uh, very, um, what's the word, uh, repressed by colonialism and now by coloniality. Because we can talk about traditional knowledge, we can talk about uh, social participation that will try to bring back those values that have been historically oppressed. And then how can we talk about in a more optimistic way when we see the structure as so embedded in coloniality? Because we can think about uh, justice and power distribution with social participation and so on. But then the next level, I, I just can't be that optimistic now. Thank you, Thais. I think we will, this is a really good question, but I think we will also let Katinka ask uh, her question as well. And then we will move on back to Letitia. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your talk and also for um, the super good questions that Thais just raised. Um, uh, I am 
not so uh, familiar with the situation in Latin America. Um, uh, but I know a little bit about extractive industries in, in North America. And I'm curious um, what you think about, because you talk about uh, economic models, right? And, and the role for social uh, organizing and social movements in, in trying to change our paradigms and, and in our actions. And my question is, um, what role do you see for for labor? Are there are there possibilities, impossibilities? Um, like I said, I uh, know very little about Latin America, so I'm very curious to to hear, um, uh, yeah, how the labor movement um, might play into this. Um, thank you. Thank you, Katinka. Um, Letitia, I post your questions in the chat now. I would so be just... happy to take. Okay. Well, let, let me go. I think. Uh, Here we go. Oh, well, well. All good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think Thai's, Thai's question. It's uh, It's the question of the of the of the, of the time. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, how to imagine and how to build and how to how to push for 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 different societies. Um, well, I think we need to act in many fronts. I, I, and this is very philosophical. I mean, there's no evidence-based uh, enough to, to build a, a future or to leave uh, colonialism. But from, from my personal uh, point of view, I mean, I would say this is more philosophical. I think we shouldn't let ourselves to be pessimistic. I mean, there is very short time. There is very um, there is very short time to, because we know in many senses global societies are close to collapses, and I don't want to sound apocalyptic, but when we look at data of bi uh, biodiversity collapse, uh, climate crisis, uh, inequality, and and so on, I mean the time frames. I mean, we need to act now. We need to. I would say we cannot afford. To be to be pessimistic, but this is more it's more a personal approach that I try to to have than, than a scientific uh, uh, based uh, proposal. Um, I would say we need to act at different levels. I think the the local level it's fundamental in terms of of, uh, of how, and I think the pandemic shows that. In, in Mexico and, and Latin America, I mean, we had a series of conversation uh, with academics and local leaders on how they were living uh, the pandemic and how the, the pandemic was affecting their, their lives and their organizational skills. And a lot of responses, I mean, I don't want to idealize the local, but a lot of responses that allowed uh, communities to go on for a year or a year and a half with little or none infections were locally driven. Um, people were getting back to the production, local production of, of food, of health systems, of course they need vaccine. Of course you cannot isolate uh, yourself. So, but you need to, to work uh, locally to, to foster capacities to face crises, such as, as the pandemic that we are still going through. Um, the second say is that we have to act globally. We cannot afford to be only focused in the local. And I think in this sense, networks like the Earth System Governance uh, Project, uh, it's really important. It's really important to, to, to share uh, worldviews, to share perspective, to build together, to try to influence uh, local decision um, making uh, spaces like the UN or, or other other agencies. I mean, the, in the advocacy for to get access to to vaccines, we need to, for example, to, to give you a case, we need to to act uh, globally. The fight for El Salvador to to be able to to prohibit to ban open pit mining in the country was a fought a long fought. Uh, driven, I mean, given uh, that took place in global scales and local local scales, I think. So we need to be able to move in, in these in this diverse uh, analytical scales and act in these diverse uh, political scenarios. And this is very general. And I think this, this should be the, the theme of uh, 
seminar or, or a Latin American conference or, um, so let's go for it. I mean, we need to build together. I am nobody to, to, to give an answer, just have some experiences and, and thoughts. And the role of labor movements. This is also a very interesting question because it leads us to, to think which coalitions and how to build democracy and how to build, to build justice. I could say that traditionally they have been uh, uh, union, mining union and, and local communities have been separated and even opposed. And this division has been very often be, been fostered by corporations. Um, in Mexico, I mean, let's say the, the case of Sonora in the border with the United States, which is uh, famous now because the largest one of, a large deposit of lithium is 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 there, and uh, corporations, not Mexican corporation, and I think Mexican corporation, national corporation, as as bad are as bad or even worse than international uh, transnational corporations. I mean, they have uh, polluted. I mean, there are constant spills uh, of toxins in the rivers and water bodies, uh, with total impunities, and so on. But uh, movements of defense of, of the land, of the resources, of local resistance against mining or against the impacts of mining. I mean, asking mining to repair ecological damage and damage uh, to public health um, are are read, are presented to the local unions as, as threatening their employment. And corporations are very careful not to hire local people as workers, but hire people from other distant regions. So you don't have contacts be between the, the local movements, the local society and, and the labor and the workers. Uh, and the workers are relatively well paid. I mean, in terms of, of the local the local income, so the local the local salaries or the local earnings. I mean, very often they, there are peasants and which are not employed. So I think corporations tend to oppose these these uh, two social movements, and a big uh, task is to to get together to to find linkages among. Uh, these two actors, social actors, that can be potentially progressed. Thank you very much, Leticia. It reminds me of your keynote from Oaxaca when you talked about realistic hope um, um, and in the context of, of pessimism and optimism for the future. Um, so to be, I recall you saying, being hopeful, but being realistically hopeful in what we can um, achieve yeah. and also imagine um i think um i want to pass on but i uh, but I, let me let me say something i mean i'm 60 something and i couldn't imagine 40 years ago or 30 years ago to be talking to a group like that uh which is globally and every time everybody is concerned about the future and a just future and a democratic future so this is there are reasons for hope and I think we we are able to build reasons for hope. Thank you. Without yeah. without denying all the horrible things that take place in the world. Thanks, Letitia. I really like that. That's a, a very good um, observation. Um, so I will open it up if anyone else has a question. I haven't seen anything in chat, but um, I have posted Letitia's question in chat, and I would love to hear some reflections um, from any of you, from the participants. Um, if you have anything, France, I see you have raised your hand and maybe if someone else um, during France questions wants to uh, post a question, just raise that hand and I will pass it on to France and then maybe um, we can take, bundle up the questions a little bit. So France, please go ahead. Thank you, Gustav. Muchas gracias, Leticia, for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to, to share a thought uh, about the, the experience of the Buen Vivir in Ecuador and, and Bolivia, uh, especially for those who, who are not uh, uh, well aware of the situation in, in Latin America, um, because 
in the, in the last two decades, in the start of this century, in, in Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, with this experience of, of one beer, uh, there was a, a kind of a cultural revolution uh, within the local uh, way of thinking themselves and, and of in the way they started to um, try to get uh, off the extractivism paradigm. Um, and it, I think it's very interesting to, to see these cases because uh, they fought, if, if we can uh, talk about that there's a, a fight between, uh, I, I think there's a fight or a, a clash between two paradigms or, or, or two ways of seeing the world. And, and the Wembivir kind of represents uh, the, the degrowth uh, paradigm that it's, it's born in the, in the global north. And besides this, Wembivir uh, uh, didn't win the fight because we all might know what happened to Evo Morales and, and to Correa, who, who, or even Lula in, in, in Brazil, okay? And, and what they tried to do when they confronted the, the, the global paradigm of extractivism in a political way, uh, that they were taken off. But this is uh, still growing here in Latin, Latin America. And I think besides, it could be seen as a pessimistic, uh, like, like they lost, you know, but people is still uh, um, working on these ideas. And, and what I think it's interesting for us in, in, in this global uh, forum is to, to see how the, the, these discourses, these narratives, like the degrowth from the global north and the Buen Vivir here in Latin America, how they, they have synergies. They are seeing like the same, we, have, we all face the same problems, the same risks in different levels. But for instance, we won't uh, change extractivism if in the global north, uh, people doesn't start to, to take in account the way they live. You know, uh, I'm talking about the, uh, the, the imperialist way of living, you know, um, that, that's a concept from Germany. I, I didn't create it here in the, it's, it's, it's not from the South, uh, but I think that that's the, the way, at least I find hope, you know, as seeing that humanity doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't matter if you are in the north or in the south. In both both sides, uh, we are seeing the same things, the same problems, and and the solution lies uh, in in a way of of finding these synergies between the narratives. So I, I wanted to share that that thought. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Franz. Um, is there anyone else, Letitia? I see that you raised your hand, which is. Very interesting. You will you'll definitely get to answer. Um, I think Thais, was that a hand I saw from you? Yes, it was. So yes, I would just like to to ask uh, something related to the Buen Vivir and the extractivist paradigm. Are they incommensurable, or there is any chance of dialogue and any kind of synergy? Thank you. If you're asking me, Thais, uh -huh. or in general, like there, are, go, go, go. <laughs> there are some papers of the synergies of, of both paradigms. I, I will send you the, the name of the authors, OK? And if I find them, I, I send it right now, OK? Okay. Well, so. I mean, just to, to end up, I mean, sorry, I mean, you have seen I like to talk. Um, well, I think in the synergies, in the relation to the synergies uh, about among, among both paradigms, I think what has, what, what fails, and I know little, I mean, I have just been in Bolivia, I haven't been to Ecuador. In the Buen Vivir paradigms, it's the, the national and global schemes. I mean, it's still, it depends at a large scale on, on these type of exports that don't create employment and don't create economic diversification, that create transfers, I mean, resources for, for transfers and very often create clientels. But uh, I think it's, um, I am afraid 
that they became uh, country brands more than, than development models. Um, so, but I think that's a huge discussion that I would love to be part of in the, in the context of the ESG. Uh, I wanted to, to, to end up telling um, two points. When these countries with where extractivism takes place are often uh, some of the countries which are rich in what's called global commons, like global biodiversity and the services they it provides, um, forest uh, extensions which are key to regulate climate again. So I don't like the idea of global commons in the sense that they can be overruled by the north using the the current. Uh, global power structures, but these are goods that, uh, and that, that if they are lost, endangered all of us. I mean, when biodiversity is lost at the extent that it's being lost in, in Latin America, I mean, this has effect for, for the future of Chinese, Dutch, American, and Canadian kids, as well as Mexican and Brazilian. Uh, so, um, so that's one point. Uh, that I would like to, to make, that you cannot isolate yourself, but we only have one planet and so on. And the other one, it's, it's also an idea uh, from Tony Bevington that he, he underlined in the conference he gave in the, in the ESG conference two years ago, that's, and relates to Thais' question, the importance to create new narratives. I mean, we are very driven by, by past paradigms and way of thinking. I mean, we need to create a narrative of, of realistic hope uh, using Gustav words. And I think that's it. Thank you very much, Leticia. And let me point out that that was indeed your own words, um, realistic hope. Uh, and. I just, I know we're kind of on the dock now and maybe Leticia, you need to run to something. I'm sure you have a busy schedule. So um, I think we will call it there. I um, don't see any more uh, questions in the chat. So uh, please join me in thanking Leticia uh, for her uh, talk. It was really, really interesting. So thank you very much. I'm delighted uh, to be part of this community and let's work together. Thank you. and. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just for the participants in the room, uh, we will in half an hour. Uh, by Leticia, if you need to go, that's. I need to run to another yeah, conference. No problem. Sorry. Problem. Have a no great problem. day. All right, you too. Um, just for the participants, we will reconvene in half an hour um, for the talk about um, anticipatory governance and imagination by Arti Gupta. Uh, hopefully, we can carry on. A lot of the thoughts and um, that Leticia presented to us in this presentation. And uh, I really um, would like to remind you about the wonder.me if you do want to just sit down a little bit with your uh, co participants and talk. Um, the link is in the chat. Uh, Jane, I see you have your hand open as well. So please. Yeah, on. I just realized that in the programming. Um, there's only a 15 minute gap between Arty and like jumping into this kind of future session, which is quite co-creative. And there will be lots of breaks worked into that. But because there's a half an hour block now, I would also recommend like taking a walk or getting some fresh air because I'm sure that we have a busy evening and online events can be very tiring, but we're in this together. It's a marathon and it's going to be really worthwhile. Okay, Thanks for that. But... If you do have the energy and you do want to connect with someone, do jump into the wonder.me. Otherwise, we will see you shortly. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for being here today now, and then I'll see you soon. So have a nice good old break. <laughs>